So in a full matrix, this might be 500 to fi uh, by 500 to 10,000 to 10,000, and the inverse is full. That's a pretty big matrix to store and to compute. And again, you don't necessarily need all of those matrix elements. So you would compute a whole lot of things that you really don't need. So just to give you an idea to store a, uh, the Hamiltonian, it's about a half a megabyte. To store a uh, 10,000 by 10,000 matrix in complex double precision, that is roughly 1.6 1 gig, 1 gigabyte. Just to put that in perspective, okay? And you're storing a whole bunch of things you don't need. Plus, it would be very expensive to compute. Okay. Also, it would be detrimentally expensive to compute. So if you had a standard operation count to do this inverse, and you do this in n cubed, you might use 10 to the 12 operations. If you use the tridiagonal LU approximation, which scales as n squared, you might have 10 to the 8 operations. And if you do a recursive green function approach that scales as n to the 1, you have about 10 to the 4 operations. You can make this uh, a factor of 10 to the 8 faster. So let's learn how to do that. Okay? By the way, if you do that once, that would be fine, right? But once is not enough. You need to do this somewhere between 100 to 1,000 energies. You need to do that 100 times to 1,000 times because we have all these energy resolved properties, right? And you do this for five to seven iterations because you do a heart rate self-consistent calculation, right? And it doesn't converge in one step. And you do that for 10 to 100 bias points to resolve an IV. So, so you need this GR about 200,000 times. So even if you did your Heary experiment and did this for, through a full inverse, which you can do in MATLAB for small matrices, you really, really don't want to do that. Okay. So compare, if you call this one second, this would take 3.2 years, and you don't get further information. You don't gain anything. Okay. So what is it you really need? Let's assume that you don't do incoherent scattering and you don't have charge effects. You, you don't care about charge. You just do a Thomas Fermi calculation for the charge and all you want is get the current. Okay? And the details are, by the way, here in this publication. So what you really need is one diagonal block of this inverse. You don't need the full inverse. You need the one diagonal block. That's kind of interesting, right? And what's your physical insight for that? Well, if it's a coherent transport through the device, that means current is continuous throughout the device. There's no current loss, no current gain. And there's no channels where you inject at a high energy and retrieve at a low energy, right? It's all happening at the same energy, at any energy given time. That means current does not change throughout the device. It's constant. So you could compute the current at every cross-section you would care, it will be the same. So let's pick one that's convenient. So we pick one here right at this edge. And all you really need is a current operator element that makes your electron hop from one side to the next side. So you, in principle you need one off-diagonal matrix element, and in this formulation you can show you already written need just one diagonal matrix element as well. Okay, So in, instead of computing the inverse of the whole thing, you need to find the inverse of one block. Okay, That could be a significant savings if you knew how to peel out that one block out of this matrix. So how would you do that? So what you do is, 
and I'll walk you through the math, you start with a left connected green function and you march it inside of the device. And you start from a right connected green function and you march it in from the right. And you connect the two on one side that gives you one true inverse of GR at that one site. Then the next question, you got to learn how to do that, right? Once you have that, you can get the curves. So if you have charge effects, if you really want to know what the charge is in the device, you got to do a little bit more, meaning the quantum mechanical charge. So here, you need to compute these matrix elements that are sort of in round. Okay, so let me give you some intuition why that is. So again, underneath, I've sort of in light gray, you see the device, right? So on the left, we said we treat the whole thing in equilibrium. So what we need are the diagonal matrix elements, just the density of states, the imaginary part of GR. That means we only need the diagonal matrix elements, the inverses of GR. So that's true on the left, and that's true on the right. And then we said, okay, we're going to inject carriers out of these uh, emitters and the collectors into the central device region, and we treat it in non-equilibrium. So you got to ask the question, if I injected an electron at this side on the left, what's its probability to be found here, 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 here and here. So you do a probability density study, so to speak, to catch an electron that came from the left, so you need that upper row here. And you do the same from the right, where you said, what would it take for an electron to be injected from the right, and what's the probability to find it on these sites throughout the device? Okay? So you catch them so to speak, after injecting from the right and the left on the respective sites you care for, and you add those contributions. So at the end, that means out of this whole big matrix that could be potentially 10,000 by 10,000, you only need the diagonal blocks in the emitter and the collector, and you need the off-diagonal blocks, one row or one column, in, in the non-equilibrium region. Clearly more work than the previous case when we just did current. So how do you do that? So you, you march all the way down with a left connected green function, and you, march, you connect it, and you march all the way back up. If you do that, you have connected the left and the right contact for all the device. So you have, you have information for all the diagonal matrix elements of the inverse. And once you have one diagonal matrix element here, you can start walking sideways over here and over here. Okay? All right. The beautiful thing about this algorithm is that its operation count goes as n times b cubed where n is the number of sites and b is the block size. Block meaning if you have a 10 by 10 matrix, it would be 10 cubed because you end up having to invert each block. So typically for multiband structures and RTDs, you might have block sizes from 10 to 20 and you might have a thousand sites. So basically you have an order n algorithm to solve this problem rather than an n cubed algorithm. Okay?